Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're delving back into the world of Black Desert Online as it stands in 2023. I had previously explored this game but took a break when the PvE endgame content seemed to revolve solely around grinding mobs. However, with the introduction of the latest expansion, Land of the Morning Light, and its new boss fights combined with Pearl Abyss's commendable efforts to reduce pay-to-win elements over the years, my interest has been reignited. Now, equipped with a new character and having completed both Awakening and Succession quests, I'm eager to offer a refreshed perspective as a returning player. If you're considering a return to Black Desert Online and are assessing its merits as either a newcomer or a returning veteran, stay tuned for first-hand insights that could inform your decision. Without further ado, let's get into it. Firstly, let's delve into the heart of the game, its combat. What more can be said about Black Desert Online's combat that hasn't already been echoed countless times? If you've watched any videos on BDO, you know its combat is top-notch. In 2023... I'm pleased to affirm this remains unchanged and stands as the game's most defining feature. After playing World of Warcraft for almost all of 2023 as my primary MMO, returning to BDO was a breath of fresh air. I'd nearly forgotten how exhilarating its combat feels. Revisiting BDO always reminds me that MMO combat doesn't have to be stale or repetitive. In this realm, BDO has out-innovated all of its competitors. I'd even argue that it not only has the best combat system among MMOs, but also stands out across all gaming genres. On my recent return, I opted to change classes. Switching from the Berserker, commonly deemed one of the easiest and best performing classes according to community tier lists, I chose the Hashashin, which resonates more with my aesthetic tastes. Seeking a different experience and prioritizing enjoyment over sheer efficacy, I embraced this class. For context, the Hashashin is reminiscent of an Arabic assassin evoking Prince of Persia and commands the desert's power. With its bladed weaponry and desert themes, it's agile, dynamic, and utterly captivating. Its intricacy, when compared to the Berserker, makes leveling the Hashashin more rewarding for me, aligning with my combat preferences. As a newcomer, the vast array of available skills felt overwhelming. The in-game skillbook, accessible via the K-Key, wasn't particularly user-friendly. After creating my Hashashin and trying to deduce which skills to utilize, I was perplexed. As seems customary with MMOs these days, my first step was to consult Reddit and YouTube for guides. One user advised progressing gradually, mastering one combo at a time. This guidance proved invaluable. By the time I undertook my Hashashin's awakening quest, I was adept with all his skills. A significant improvement to my combat experience was binding the shift key to my Razer Naga Pro Mouse. Given the Hashashin's frequent use of the shift key for dodging and casting, this alleviated the strain on my hand. I also mapped the control key to my mouse, for easier game UI access and horse summoning. These tweaks significantly uplifted my gameplay experience. The game offers an integrated system to monitor skill cooldowns, somewhat akin to a rudimentary version of weak auras. I've organized my cooldowns based on the involved mouse button streamlining my combat engagement. In addressing combat difficulty, my character on the seasonal server designed for new players faced minimal challenges. Most mobs could be killed with one hit. However, this setup has its merits. BDO's intricate skills and combos, particularly for novices, mean that players benefit from a forgiving environment where they can concentrate on mastering their moves. While initial quest lines can feel like an extended tutorial, they are crucial given the time it takes to truly grasp a class's combat in this game. Yet upon reaching the Media quest line, I noticed a spike in difficulty. Main quests often feature fetch tasks or standard interactions with NPCs, Occasionally, a spontaneous quest may pop up in a combat zone, setting seemingly outrageous kill counts. Yet, in BDO, not only do I not dread these tasks, I eagerly anticipate them. Sometimes I linger, engaging mobs even post-completion, purely for the thrill. Regarding endgame content, I've heard of the introduction of new boss fights in the recent expansion, Land of the Morning Light. My past BDO endeavors left me wanting more from its PvE content which was then dominated by PvP. In other MMOs, I've always gravitated towards PvE, with Guild Wars 2 being a PvP exception. As a primary Mythic Plus player in WoW, I was thrilled to discover BDO's addition of challenging PvE boss blitzes in this expansion, motivating my return and my ongoing character progression. Next, I'd like to address another of BDO's strong suits, its graphics. Despite the game being seven years post-release, its in-game world remains utterly captivating. 
Both the environmental and character graphics are intricately detailed, and the dynamic weather effects add another layer of immersion. Whether you're witnessing snowfall, a downpour, or a serene sunset, the visuals are a feast for the eyes. However, this exquisite detail is somewhat of a double-edged sword when traversing at high speeds. Even on the remastered settings, which rank as the second highest graphical option, I encounter pronounced and distracting pop-ins. Perhaps for those with a powerhouse PC capable of handling the Pinnacle Ultra settings, the render distance might be less of an issue. Yet, on my rig equipped with an RTX 3070 pushing the game to its ultra limits, sees the frame rate dip to around 30 FPS. It's possible that my PC isn't entirely up to the challenge, or perhaps the game engine grapples with rendering such intricate details swiftly over expansive distances. Consequently, the game prioritizes rendering finer details proximate to your character, and then elaborates on these details as you progress, leading to the noticeable pop-ins. Technical hitches aside, BDO's visuals consistently astonish me. The entirely open-world design, devoid of areas sequestered behind quest or reputation barriers, amplifies its immersive appeal. In my estimation, BDO boasts one of the most immersive worlds of any MORPG. Not necessarily from a lore perspective, but in terms of graphic brilliance and unbridled exploration. Especially since I'm experiencing this on an ultra-wide monitor. One additional point that further enriched my visual experience was delving into the game's graphic settings. By enabling the cinematic filter and fine-tuning the contrast and gamma values, I enhanced the game's visual appeal. I'd urge all players to tinker with these settings to achieve the most visually rewarding experience on their respective displays. This brings me to my next point, the world of BDO. As I previously highlighted, the game's world is vast and entirely open. It overflows with diverse biomes from coastal Mediterranean-inspired towns and cities echoing Roman architecture to elven forests, haunting castle cities, mountainous settlements, snow-covered terrains, and deserts echoing Arabian lore. The most recent expansion even showcases East Asian-inspired locales and structures. One of the aspects of BDO's world that I genuinely appreciate is its navigability. I've never felt inconvenienced moving around in this game, a sentiment I can't extend to many other MMOs. This is notable considering BDO might boast the most expansive open world of any MMO currently available, a feat made manageable thanks to its autopath system. While some might argue that such a system detracts from the immersive experience, I find it invaluable. Features that are conceptually ideal for RPG immersion can often be vexing in actual gameplay. In fact, this game benefits tremendously from its autopath feature. Without it, traversing such an expansive realm would be overwhelming. There's a certain serenity in watching the game's environment, as my character autonomously navigates diverse biomes. The autopath isn't the sole navigation method either. Players can set it to delineate a route, and the game will subsequently generate a path to be manually followed. The game's navigational features are truly top-notch. A noteworthy addition is the search function for any NPC, complemented by markers for points of interest like auction houses and blacksmiths. Furthermore, a recent update introduced a fast travel mechanism in the game via the Magnus Questline, a much-needed feature given BDO's vast landscapes. On a tangential note, I was recently gifted a Tier 9 Pegasus horse during an event. This might have somewhat skewed my perspective on the game's traversal mechanics. Recalling my initial BDO days, I was equipped with a basic Tier 5 horse, which felt rather awkward and often proved frustrating. For instance, sudden stops at high speeds would result in my character being thrown off, momentarily rendering him immobile. The Tier 9 horse, on the other hand, is a joy to command. It's nimble, seamless in its movements, swift, and boasts a gliding feature. This steed has unquestionably enhanced my travel experience in the game, underscoring the value of a reliable mount in BDO's vast realm. Next, let's explore the lore and main story of the game. During my second playthrough, I was determined to immerse myself in the game's story, taking the time to read quests and understand the evolving narrative. Now both new and returning players have a choice of three starting areas, the ancient stone chamber, the original starting zone, the mountain of eternal winter, from the prior expansion, and the land of the morning light, from the most recent expansion. Keen to experience the game in its original essence, I chose the Belenos starting zone. The Belenos questline was recently enriched with voiceovers, which I found to be of decent quality. As I ventured through Belenos, 
I was committed to not skipping any quests, striving to weave together the game's intricate lore. I immersed myself in the mysteries surrounding the ancients, Idana, the essence of the Black Spirits, and the tales of Belenos and its neighboring regions. However, my enthusiasm waned post-Belenos, particularly when the voiceovers ceased. Despite my initial intention to thoroughly engage with the quest narratives, their sheer volume soon led me to instinctively spam the R key to skip them. Still intrigued by the lore, I scoured the internet to delve deeper into the narrative beyond the Belenos arc. Surprisingly, comprehensive information on BDO's lore is scarce. Unlike MMOs such as WoW, which have extensive online databases like WoWhead and WoWpedia, BDO appears somewhat neglected. There is a BDO wiki on fandom, but it offers a cursory overview and seems incomplete. Moreover, I couldn't identify any YouTube content creators who focus solely on BDO lore. While I did stumble upon some community-curated lore documents on Google Docs, they came across as unstructured and lacking depth. The official BDO website provides only a handful of articles detailing the histories of select regions, in my opinion. This game desperately needs a thorough wiki dedicated to its intricate lore. My initial impressions as a newcomer suggest that the BDO universe is brimming with fascinating secrets and historical tales. There's no doubt that the game boasts the potential for a deep lore. However, the fragmented nature of available information, both in-game and online, hampers newcomers like me from truly immersing ourselves in and appreciating the game's rich narrative and vast universe. Turning to a significant concern, the UI of BDO. For anyone who has glanced at BDO content online, complaints about its user interface are hard to miss. Frankly, this UI cries out for an overhaul. I have always been inclined towards minimalist designs, especially when it comes to MMO user interfaces. In many MMOs, players are given the liberty to embrace this minimalist style through add-ons or mods. However, BDO prohibits such add-ons. Still, its default UI offers some room for customization, allowing me to disable many extraneous features such as the glowing path, side quest tracking, skill log, kill notifications, item drop log, and more. As for the flood of irritating notifications that dominate the screen, like those announcing other players' enhancement successes or auction house listings that pop up unexpectedly, I've removed those too. In a game as visually captivating as BDO, it's baffling how the UI so often detracts from its beauty. It's rather astounding to think that despite its clutter, the current UI is an improvement over its predecessors. It's hard to even picture the original UI. After rigorous tweaking in the settings, I've shaped my UI to be less invasive. Most of the intrusive elements are now deactivated. For convenience, I've grouped all my cooldowns, keybinds, as well as HP and MP bars at the bottom center of the screen. On a related note, item management in the game also feels overwhelmingly convoluted. Rejoining the game, I was immediately swamped by what seemed like a deluge of items, their purposes a mystery. As I progressed, the tidal wave of items never let up. Loot isn't just from mobs. The game continuously lavishes rewards upon players, from loyalty and return bonuses to daily passes and season passes. What's the rationale behind this design? Can developers sincerely claim this enhances gameplay? The problem is compounded by the excessively detailed tooltips. Hovering over an item displays a long-winded description that sometimes sprawls across several paragraphs. For a newcomer, it's dizzying and intimidating. With more time invested, I've begun to discern the logic behind this chaos. The torrent of rewards and items correlates to the multiple progression routes in BDO. I'm not objecting to this variety. However, the challenge lies in the lack of a cohesive system to channel this progression without an endless accumulation of items. These pathways span from gear and fishing to housing, trading, and more. Each progression route seems to have its own cache of unique items. Consider early game enhancement. There are items to boost your success rate, items to guard against degradation upon failed attempts, time-bound enhancement boosts, tiered enhancement tools, and the list goes on. Deepening this issue, developers appear to be countering the clutter not by simplifying, but by layering newer systems over existing ones. When players contend that enhancement odds are unreasonably low, the solution provided is a new, time-bound reward, promising a single enhancement success. Just another fleeting item to keep tabs on. Amid an intricate gearing procedure, players are now burdened with decisions about which item to enhance and when, given its limited shelf life. From my perspective as a relative newcomer, BDO's strategy seems misguided. 
It feels like trying to extinguish a fire with gasoline, layering system upon system, leading to significant feature overload. For those venturing into the game, my suggestion is to momentarily set aside most of these systems and rewards. Start gradually. Zero in on a few foundational mechanics, perhaps gearing or horse management. Gaining mastery in this game isn't an overnight affair, but with persistence, you'll start to navigate BDO's multifaceted landscapes and perhaps discern order amid the chaos. That is, of course, if you can endure without bowing out in sheer frustration. Compared to other MMOs, every activity in BDO seems to be tied to a progression system, and the progression system is often convoluted. For newcomers, this can be overwhelming. Consider horse riding, for instance. There's not only the horse level to worry about, but also the training life skill related to horse riding, and this barely scratches the surface. With elements like mount items, horse skills, stats, buffs, and more, progression in BDO is often complex, a trait consistent across all its progression paths. The plethora of progression options, paired with the complex mechanics one needs to grasp, can be daunting. While a diverse array of progression paths is generally seen as a strength in MMOs, BDO could do a better job introducing players to these systems and their intricate mechanics. When I started, I found myself investing hours in community resources just to understand the game's nuanced progression. In many ways, BDO mirrors a sandbox game. It offers vast, open-ended experiences, allowing players the freedom to shape their own adventures. Whether this is viewed as a strength or a shortcoming is subjective, one area where BDO truly stands out in terms of progression philosophy and contrasting with many MMOs is its dedication to evergreen progression systems. This approach ensures that players consistently have a growth path that remains relevant rather than the temporary borrowed power seen in other games. To the best of my knowledge, many of BDO's progression systems, including horse training, have retained their significance since the game's launch, a consistency I deeply value. Regarding gear enhancement, which serves as the primary gear progression route in BDO, I'm familiar with past criticisms. Many highlighted its strong dependence on RNG and potential pay-to-win mechanics. Yet, it appears that players can now choose to sidestep this process by grinding for gold and buying the desired gear directly from the auction house. This option effectively removes the unpredictability of RNG, a shift I wholeheartedly appreciate given my aversion to such mechanics. But as with most MMOs, and BDO in particular, progression leans more toward a marathon than a sprint. I'm committed to pacing myself, cherishing the journey rather than racing to the end game. Next, I'd like to discuss character creation and customization. This is another area where BDO excels, often receiving praise from players. The character customization in this game is incredibly detailed, surpassing any MMO I've experienced. However, there are certain limitations, particularly when it comes to gender and racial options for classes. For instance, with Berserkers, players are restricted to a hunched back, balding, somewhat unattractive giant man. No matter the adjustments made, the outcome is still a hunched, balding giant man. Despite this, I managed to craft a unique-looking berserker by downloading a WoW Orc design another player had made in a different region. I found this design on a website called Garmouth.com, which features a beauty album section that showcases top customizations from every BDO region. Although the game has its own built-in beauty album, it lacks customizations from all nine regions. Hence, if you're on the NA server, you can't access top customizations from, let's say, the Russian server. The orc design I picked was popular in the C region and wasn't available on NA servers. Another point of discussion is gear customization. The game falls short in providing visually impressive in-game armors. Many look quite basic. The truly exceptional armors and weapons are, regrettably, available only as cash items. On the bright side, these items can be mixed and matched granting players the ability to forge a unique appearance for their characters. When I first delved into the game, I was prepared to spend considerably on outfits and costumes, given my penchant for character aesthetics. However, since I began playing, I've been gifted numerous free costume boxes from Pearl Abyss. These boxes furnished me with a variety of skins for my characters, like the Berserker, Sage, Warrior, and Hashashin, at no expense. Players can also buy these costumes from others in the auction house, either as complete sets or as individual parts. The time it takes to secure costumes this way can vary, ranging from mere minutes to weeks, influenced by market dynamics and perhaps a sprinkle of luck. These free costume boxes from PA can also be traded among players, so there's no compulsion to use them if you prefer not to. 
considering the myriad ways of obtaining costumes without spending a dime nowadays. I truly believe there's no longer any necessity for players to buy costumes with real money. Another feature of armor customization is the ability to continuously dye armor pieces using Merv's palette. This feature remains accessible as long as the value pack buff, akin to a VIP status, is active, usually for a span of 30 days. Players can buy this pack or occasionally receive it as an in-game bonus. While I've never purchased a value pack, I've been given several for free during my gameplay. Besides the value pack, there are two other optional subscription buffs available, the Blessing of Camus Sylvia and the Secret Old Moon Book. The presence of these three separate buffs epitomizes what I alluded to as feature bloat earlier. It's perplexing why these buffs aren't consolidated into one optional subscription. Sometimes it seems the developers enjoy adding complexity just for its own sake. Managing these optional buffs, given their varied durations, feels needlessly convoluted. Nonetheless, the value pack also provides unlimited access to the beauty shop. This means players can re-enter the character customization interface at any point after their first setup, as often as they wish, facilitating continuous modifications. Given these features, armor transmogs, dyes, and character personalization, there's extensive potential for in-game fashion. Visually, the armor is breathtaking. This graphical excellence is consistent throughout the game. Its realism shines through as armor looks wet in the rain, gets covered in snow during snowfalls, and exhibits wear and tear when damaged, highlighting the game's unmatched visual fidelity. Lastly, I'd like to discuss the game's monetization from a newcomer's perspective. Although I've had the game on my PC for some time, I know that its price fluctuates. It frequently goes on sale, sometimes for as low as $5.00, and there have been occasions where it was available for free. I can't speak confidently about the game's potential pay-to-win mechanics in the endgame, as I haven't reached that stage yet. However, based on feedback from veteran players and the broader community, it seems that the pay-to-win aspect has been significantly reduced. When it comes to gear progression in the early to mid-game, I've managed to enhance my gear to Pentavala without needing to spend real money on cash shop items. Regarding other non-gear-related pay-to-win or pay-for-convenience features, such as pets that offer buffs and auto-loot, maids for remote bank and auction house access, expanded weight limits, extra inventory slots, and optional subscription buffs, I've obtained many of these without spending a dime. I even received a celestial horse calling horn for free. Frankly, I'm surprised by the sheer number of rewards in my inventory, as the game consistently provides me with items. I assume... This is Pearl Abyss's approach to combat the perception of pay-to-win or pay-for-convenience elements in the game. Instead of completely eliminating these items, they gift them to players during limited-time events. However, while I appreciate these freebies, there's a concerning aspect concerning in-game currency. The game employs a widely used yet manipulative marketing strategy. It purposefully obscures the direct conversion of real money to in-game currency. By doing so, it masks the actual cost of in-game items possibly leading players to unintentionally overspend. The process is as follows. First, you purchase the in-game currency named A-Coin with real money. Then with your A-Coin, you buy Pearls, another in-game currency. For example, to secure the Napeheart campsite without using discount coupons, an additional in-game reward, you'd need 4,900 Pearls. But there's a catch. You can't directly purchase 4,900 Pearls or 4,900 A-Coin. The nearest available option is to buy 6,000 A-Coin for $1.60 USD. This then nudges you towards the Pearl Box that provides 6,000, plus a bonus of 600 Pearls, making it seem like you're receiving extra value. In reality, you only wanted 4,900 Pearls, but now you're obliged to shell out an extra $11 to get the initial item you sought. It's discouraging to see such tactics in play, especially since many turn to video games for relaxation and escape, only to find themselves ensnared by manipulative marketing ploys, even in these virtual worlds. While it's reasonable that companies need to earn revenue, especially for live service games, requiring consistent funding, employing such deceptive strategies tarnishes the game's reputation. I'd personally prefer a straightforward monthly subscription fee rather than navigating these intricate monetization strategies. In conclusion, Black Desert Online masterfully intertwines a myriad of captivating elements. While its rich lore is mesmerizing, it is sometimes overshadowed due to a limited number of online references and an in-game depiction in need of additional polish. 
Combat serves as its crown jewel, offering an impeccable blend of fluid movements and dynamic sequences that perpetually engage players. Although there are occasional visual hiccups, such as pop-ins, the intricacy and detail in the graphics are undeniably magnificent. Progressing in BDO can feel akin to navigating an intricate maze. Its profound depth and diversity exhilarate seasoned players, but can be daunting to newcomers. For those new to this vast world, I suggest a gradual exploration, becoming familiar with the game's layered systems step by step. The in-game store, previously under scrutiny, has witnessed notable improvements, but some concerns persist, albeit softened by the game's generous rewards. At its essence, BDO carves out a niche, delivering an unmatched MMO experience that differentiates it from others in the market. Armed with top-tier combat mechanics from the outset and jaw-dropping visuals, it caters to a more solitary MMO adventure. Instead of placing a heavy emphasis on instanced content, it facilitates solo progression while simultaneously providing opportunities for collaborative gameplay. If these attributes align with your gaming preferences, BDO is undeniably the MMO to explore in depth. My progression with my Hashashin character has been a deeply fulfilling experience. I'm filled with excitement to take on the new boss Blitz endgame challenges, traverse the East Asian regions, and embellish my Grana home. If these first impressions offer you a window into the game's essence, Please tap the like button and consider subscribing for more videos on BDO, other MMOs, and open world titles. I will see you in the next one.